Good morning, I'm Adam Sexton. The countdown is on less than a month to go before the state primary election. Before we head to the Democratic National Convention this week, we wanted to check in with the top two Republican candidates for governor. And this morning, we're starting off with former Senate President Chuck Morse. Thanks for being here, Senator. Appreciate it. Good morning, Adam. I just want you to know I've been crisscrossing the state, shaking hands, and voters are listening, and they certainly want to keep New Hampshire, New Hampshire, and... They're buying into the campaign. It's going to be a great grassroots campaign this fall. And certainly a lot of people in these last two to three weeks, you get may, uh, many more people paying attention, some just for the first time. But, you're, you know, you're fighting an uphill battle on multiple fronts against Kelly Ayotte. You know, money, name recognition, all of it. What is the most compelling reason for conservative voters, Republican voters in this primary, to back Chuck Morse? Yeah, I think the most compelling reason is my record in Concord. You know, I drove down taxes in Concord. I helped small businesses by cutting business taxes. We took the interest in dividends tax. It'll be completely gone in 2025. You know, we made our state have constitutional carry, so we became the safest state in the nation. And the one thing that really sticks out between the differences of Kelly and Chuck Morse is certainly when we talk about education freedom accounts. When Kelly was in the U.S. Senate, she voted against giving um, poor people the choice of having school choice. And I think that's a big difference of how I believe our state should function. Do you think the federal government should be dictating education policy like that from Washington, though? No, I think when the federal government gets out of education, when Donald Trump's uh, the president, I think New Hampshire will make those decisions. And I do believe choice is going to be what drives education policy. That contrast between you and Senator Ayotte, you know, she's under fire right now over having served on the board of Blackstone. That's the nation's number one landlord, making six figures as the company raises rents. That's the allegation uh, is that she had, uh, you know, the allegation being that she had a hand somehow in making housing less affordable in New Hampshire. Is that fair criticism? Well, I think it shows a dramatic difference between the two candidates. You know, I'm still that candidate that gets up at 4 a.m. and goes to work to make a living. Um, I did it when I was Senate president. You know, as I'm on the campaign trail, I'm still doing the same thing. And Kelly went to Washington, and when she left Washington, she went on boards and started collecting these outrageous sums and has not talked to the voters about it. New Hampshire isn't for sale. And, and that's what we should be talking about in this last month. You know, you've been one of the key figures in shaping policy at the State House, as you've noted. So, you know, obviously housing is very unaffordable right now. Did you play a role somehow in the status quo of getting us to where we are, where people can't afford to live here? Oh, you know what we did? We basically made a great economy in New Hampshire. We've created a successful state working with Governor Sununu. And I'm telling you what's happening is it's creating more housing shortages. When I was Senate President, I came up with something that I believe works. I believe in local control, but in those communities that want to work with us, let's start working with them on infrastructure like water and roads. That's working. We started that when I was Senate President. We need to continue it. We can do this pretty quick. And let's remember one thing. We're asking the communities to permit in a much speedier way. We need to make sure that our departments, DOT, DES, they're responding too. That's where someone that's a business person going to Concord and being a governor will work because I can work with those departments. Yeah, some of those delays on driveway permits can get pretty Over crazy a year there. right now, and that's not going to work to solve this crisis. You know, you mentioned Governor Sununu there. Obviously, he's endorsing your opponent, Kelly Ayotte. That was your partner in governance for a long time between uh, the corner offices, uh, one floor above each other at the State House. You know, in, in your uh, response to that, in the press release, you said you found that endorsement comical. What, what's so funny about it? Well, I think it's fun. Governor Sununu and I worked well together. You know, it was a success. Pro-jobs, pro-growth, family first, free estate in the nation. That's what we did. But where we disagreed, you know, the governor and I disagreed during COVID on closing anything in the state in New Hampshire. We certainly disagreed over President Trump and throwing conservatives under the bus. And just recently, I certainly disagree with him on having boys and girls locker rooms or bathrooms. And I can tell you this, where it becomes comical is the fact that he thinks Kelly Ayotte should be the next governor. That, I don't believe, is anywhere clear to the record that I've run in the state doing things for the people in New Hampshire. And, you know, let's be clear how I did it. I was a volunteer. 125 bucks a year, the best bargain you got in this state for me being Senate President um, while Kelly was down in Washington taking huge sums of money from corporations. 
You mentioned HB 396. It is the so-called Women's Spaces Bill. Uh, it's new to veto that. Uh, this is, you know, no transgender individuals in women's locker rooms, bathrooms, uh, women's spaces, things like that, prisons. Uh, you know, Governor Sununu said that there is not a problem to solve with this here in New Hampshire, that no examples have presented themselves. And I haven't heard critics come up with an example. Is there an example of where this has been an issue in the Granite State? Well, let's look at it this way. As a father and all the fathers in the state of New Hampshire, I have a daughter, Emma. She played ball. She played field hockey. You know, she played basketball. Would you want to even hear this talk that a boy was going to be in her locker room, you know, while she was showering or in her bathroom? It's an insane concept. We need to make it very clear that it's not acceptable in society. Should gender identity be a protected class? We should not allow boys and girls locker rooms, prisons, or bathrooms. And I think we need to make sure that we take care of that. You know, the best example was Riley Gaines coming here and talking about the fact that she talked to women prisoners in New Hampshire. And women prisoners concerned with that men could declare that they are women in our prisons, pedophiles, rapists, and then end up in a women's prison. That's wrong. And we should make sure that men and women are protected. The protected class, though, you voted against that in 2018, making gender identity a protected class. Would you want to roll that back as governor? I believe that we should make sure that we protect young women from men in the bathrooms, the locker rooms, and the prisons. On the trail, I've been hearing a lot of skepticism from you on the issue of offshore wind. And, uh, you know, the Gulf of Maine seems like a big opportunity uh, to be able to harness all of that. There had been seemingly a bipartisan feel around that. It seems like there's a split right now. What is it about offshore wind that has you so skeptical at the moment? Well, I think it's the fact that, you know, the fishermen are the ones that contacted me. And this was several months ago, and we started going out and talking to them. And when you start talking to people, which is what government should be doing, you find out that they're going to destroy the fishing industry. They're going to pollute the waters off our coast. And Adam, it's not solving anything for those people that are talking about green energy. Because the cost of doing this has not been explored. They're putting billions into people's pockets that they're not going to be able to present a concept that's going to work off the coast of Maine, New Hampshire, Massachusetts. It, 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 it's not going to work, and it's, the electricity that's going to be produced is going to cost double anything we're looking at right now. We can do better than this, and that's what we're fighting for. We're fighting for New Hampshire values. We're fighting for those fishermen, and I really think that when we start to look at projects like that, we need to sit down and we used to talk about it with everybody. And you're going to find out that it doesn't work. It just happened. We're building a parking garage right next to the state house. And the engineers presented a plan to put in electric charging stations right in the parking garage. Well, the speaker and I said, absolutely not, right? It's just not going to work. Come to find out, an East Keys Kingston fire chief is out there proving what a disaster these charging these batteries are that are in these cars and the fires that they could have. Even Connecticut, Connecticut outlawed putting charging stations in parking garages. Um, we have to think these things through. You know, these concepts that are being presented, they really don't create the green energy that these people want. We're going to be flying our fish, you know, from another country to here because we're going to destroy the stock that we have off our coast. Well, the consequences of the status quo are pretty obvious as well. I mean, pregnant women and kids under seven can only have one serving of fresh fish from New Hampshire per month. There's so much mercury in there. So why is that acceptable? Well, it's not acceptable. But the fact is, you're going to make it worse by doing... When we put these blades out there that are on these wind turbines, they have to be changed every two years. Why? because all the paint and stuff on the blades, or whatever you, you're talking about, the plastic, it peels off and it goes into the ocean and it ruins the bait that the other fish are eating. Um, it's not gonna work. And, and that's every two years it's dumping into our oceans. It, it doesn't make any sense. You've cut taxes quite a bit. You mentioned that already. You know, the next governor may actually cut spending. What were the lessons learned the last time the state went through a big recession and you did have to cut spending, uh, you know, back in that 2011, 2012 period? What would you do differently if you had to cut spending in a big way again as governor? 
Well, remember, though, that lesson was in 2011. We're $800 million in the hole, and there were 100 new taxes and fees that the Democrats had put in place. We eliminated the 100 new taxes and fees, and we balanced the budget by $800 million. You know, when we did that, we saw that New Hampshire was heading in the wrong direction. And we were the 47th highest business taxes in the nation. I want to explain this because we started fixing this in 2015. We presented a budget to Governor Hassan that had tax cuts for businesses, let's fix this. And we started working on mental health, disabled children. We started solving problems because we knew we were growing income. We overrode Governor Hassan's veto of that budget in September. And what did Kelly Ayotte do? She lost a U.S. Senate seat in November to Governor Hassan because she couldn't support Donald Trump and she had to write someone else in. That's not uniting the Republican Party and solving budget problems in this state. And that's really not the concepts we should be using. All right, Senator Morse, thanks for your time on Close Up. We'll see you out there on the trail and for a debate pretty soon as well. Great. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. All right, stay with us. After the break, we'll talk to Kelly Ayotte.